Good afternoon. I'm Cynthia Nations, current president of the UC Master Gardeners of San Mateo and San, Mateo, um, San Francisco counties. We welcome you to our fourth spring edible series, Growing Herbs. You're in for a real treat. Today, you will learn the basics of growing, harvesting, and using culinary herbs. Our co-presenters are UC Master Gardeners, Kathy Fleming and Cindy Morris. Kathy loves creating a balance at her peninsula home by growing culinary herbs and flowers in containers and in her perennial landscape. She uses the herbs and edible flowers in many recipes, either fresh and or dried, and loves sharing them with friends and neighbors. Kathy has been a master gardener since 2006 and has always enjoyed speaking and sharing ideas about her passion. Cindy has had a love affair with plants since the fourth grade. Her father worked at Ferry Moore Seed Company and she loved peeking into the labs to see all the experiments. She enjoys germinating seeds and finds it fascinating how a small seed can turn into a beautiful plant. And you will uh, understand both of our presenters love of gardening, gardening and gardening herbs specifically uh, during their presentation. During the presentation, you have the opportunity to type in questions you may have. Type in the name of your city before typing in your question. After the presentation, our chat monitors will select questions for Kathy and Cindy to answer. Uh, if your question is not answered by any chance, you can type in your questions on our uh, MG helpline and helpline information is found on our website where you can uh, register. A copy of the presentation and the video will be found on our UCMG website uh, in the next few weeks. And now let me present Kathy and Cindy. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. So we're going to our first slide. And I just wanna explain something before we get started too much, just as our title page here. But uh, during the presentation on each slide, you usually will see a couple of herbs or edible flowers on the side. I, we tried to put names underneath them, not on these, but because we wanna show things that are in our backyards and our friends' backyards. So in this particular slide, the very first one, on our left by our left hand is an herb called Lovage that we might talk about a little later too. It's uh, a perennial. And on the other side is, surprise, it's parsley. So you see how we work with this. We use the common names. We're not using uh, the official botanical names for our presentation, just so we're all on the same page as to what's what. So we'll continue here and Cindy will, will follow through. On the next slide. This is an um, introduction to what we'll be talking about today. Um, we're going to try to cover a lot of um, subject matter, um, how to grow herbs, how to propagate herbs, how to maintain herbs, harvesting herbs, and using your herbs. So we're going to do our very best to um, share what we know to you, and we hope that you enjoy the, um, the lecture. So let's get started. Okay. So okay. next slide, please. Okay, so here, here's some herbs here. So herbs, the thing with herbs is that they're the best of both worlds in my, in my opinion in life, but they're the best of both worlds because they're not only just ornamental, you will find dozens of different shades of green for every herbs, different, different greens, a few yellows. You see something in, in this little pot here that you can't really tell maybe what's what, but there's chives in there and sage. Uh, there's some thyme. It looks like lemon thyme in there, tarragon and something else I'm not quite sure. But they're not only ornamental, they're delicious too. And they have great scents. They, they thrive in containers and in our gardens, they share scents with all the other plants and with you when you're, when you're out in your garden in the front or the back with your cup of tea or whatever, you'll enjoy not only looking at them, but the scents of them too. They, they share their scents all spring, summer, and a lot of the fall long in, in California. A, a few plants of each kind of herb will help you accentuate your meals give you some beverages you may really 
really like that we're going to talk about some of this as we get into our talk a little bit here and just uh, supply adequate amount for your dishes. So just like vegetables and landscape plants, our herbs are divided into three different groups. Two are the most common, the first one being perennial. So perennial, perennial plants is any, any herb or edible flower that has multiple growing seasons. So uh, they go through their seeding and flowering and then you use them and you take care of maintain them over winter and then you will see them the next year. So that's a perennial, it's repeated, it's, it's a repeated process. And a lot of times um, they'll last three four, three, four years or more. So Mediterranean herbs are like, or Mediterranean herbs are very commonly perennial herbs. It grows in our climates here. And they're the herbs you might see on the hillside in Europe. Maybe thyme, oregano, rosemary, the ones that, that, that are um, grown on their land without a lot of water added and things like that. Once your herbs established, that's how it works. The next group is the annual. So we all know that completes a life cycle in one year. Usually it starts from seed, it grows roots, and it gives you lots of, lots of herb, and then, and then the flowering happens and it's going to die back. It might spread some seed on the ground and you might get a new plant the next year, but you can't really count on that unless it happens all the time. So that's your annual. That might be basil, anise, hyssa, um, cilantro, and borage. And you know, there's, there's many others. So the other group, the third group, which is a very small group, is called biennial. It requires two years of growing. So the first year, parsley is uh, in, in, in temperate climate and in my garden, parsley is one of those biennial plants. It grows the first year you get your little plant or you, you start your seeds, however you're gonna do it. And it, it has your plant that's gonna grow lush and give you lots of parsley for the year. If you have it in a bigger container, you'll get a lot for the whole year. And then we let it rest over the winter. And then the next year it will flower. And it usually, it usually does flower before it dies back. I always keep two in my garden because that way I have one for bees and butterflies and everybody. And the other one I use to cook with. So parsley is, I said parsley is one, caraway is another one. And we, in the very back of our slide deck, we have some links and one of them is a UC link that gives culinary herbs and it tells you what the herb is, what they, it's, it's perennial, annual or biennial and some other information on it, but it, it goes right to our public website. So that's it for the different types of herbs. So let's see how to grow them now. So next slide. Growing herbs is a really good way. If you're interested in growing vegetables, and you haven't done so before, herbs are a really good way to start because they're really pretty easy to grow. And you'll have success and you'll feel so confident you'll be ready to go to tomatoes. Um, so um, the first thing that um, we need to know about growing herbs is that you know, you know where they came from. You know they came from your backyard, there's no poison on them, um, the soil is clean, and that's a very um, reassuring thing to know. Plus, uh, the herbs in the grocery store sometimes are a year old by the time they get to the grocery store. So um, you can have nice fresh herbs from your backyard. Um, they need about six to eight hours of sun a day. And I wouldn't cheat them because the sun is responsible for creating the starch that creates the volatile oils in the herb, which makes them taste delicious. Um, some herbs can do with a little less sun, parsley, cilantro, mint. Um, I have a herb garden in San Carlos. Um, at the San Carlos City Hall, Master Gardeners has a native garden. And in the pocket of the library, I have an herb garden. And one of my beds is almost full shade. And I chose to put mint in that bed. I have all kinds of mints and it does really well. Um, before you select your herbs to plant. You want to make sure that you know how large they're going to be, how wide they're going to spread. So you make sure you put them in the right place in your garden, 
in your flower bed. Um, and if you can, if you can meet the right growing conditions, it's great to have them out next to your kitchen. I have some that grow on the side of my house and in the winter I have to get my flashlight out and you know hobble around there to try to cut the, um, the herbs down. And I, I really like them close to my uh, back door so that I can enjoy them. Um, herbs need about, they don't need very much water. As Cassie said, they, a lot of the herbs that we grow grow up in the mountains. There certainly is marshy herbs that like marsh type conditions, but the herbs that we grow, uh, oregano, uh, sage, uh, thyme, all grows um, in low water conditions. So they do very well with, um, you know, watering once a week. If it's in a container, then you have to water more often. Um, herbs do great in containers because they have small uh, root formations and um, they, they like being in containers because of those small roots. So um, if you want to, I like to cluster the herbs together in a corner and make a little kind of an arrangement of different pots and things full of herbs, different heights and stuff. Um, herbs like uh, good soil, like everything else, um, nice loomy soil. Um, they like a little compost um, once a year with mulch. Um, I don't fertilize my herbs. Um, I do it by putting compost on, on the soil. I do that with most of my plants. Um, because if you put fertilizer on something, it is telling the plant to grow. And if the plant grows, an herb grows, it will grow and flower. And we don't want that. We want the herb to maintain no flowers because it will taste better. If it goes to flower, the energy goes to the flowers which takes away from our lovely leaves that we want to uh, use in our cooking. So we don't encourage them to grow fast. Um, they're great drought tolerant um, plants, as I said. They don't require a lot of water. Some require more than others, but if you um, choose to have a drought tolerant herb garden, you certainly can by um, uh, selecting herbs that um, from the Mediterranean. Um, we like uh, irrigation. We like um, uh, drip irrigation where we can um, in our pots or in the soil. You can grow herbs in the ground, in containers. Um, either way, they'll grow. Um, if you can't have drip irrigation, then water by hand. But don't water the leaves necessarily, just water the um, the soil, or if you have a tray under it, put the water in the tray and let it soak up the water. Um, and there's a lot of native plants um, that grow very well in this area. Um, I grow sage, um, yarrow, <clears throat> and part of, to me, part of edible, or part of the herb family is the edible flowers. Grow edible flowers in your landscape um, with your herbs, um, yarrow, calendula, nasturtium, lavender. Um, lavender is not necessarily a, a native, but it sure is popular in the garden. Um, so, if you if you um, if you if you um, add in edible flowers you will have a really lovely, and it draws bees and other in, beneficial insects into your garden. So I wanted to show you this little thing that I um, made. I made this little bouquet. Um, it's made of, um, it's made of oregano, lemon, uh, um, this is um, lemongrass, and th these are nasturtium leaves, which are very tasty. This whole thing is edible. Yarrow, uh, fennel flower. Um, I like to make these and I put bow around it. And I like to give these as hostess gifts to um, when I go out for dinner, when I go out to dinner, which hasn't been very often. But when I do, I like to take a little hostess gift with me. And um, that little bouquet is great. People really appreciate you bringing something from your garden that you put together for them. Uh, very, very nice gift. 
Plus they can uh, dry it, they can eat it, uh, use it cooking or just enjoy the bouquet. Um, so now let's go on to Kathy. Okay. Thank you, Cindy. You're welcome. So let's go one more slide. So Cindy was talking earlier about not letting a plant go to flower. Well, you don't want it to go to flower because you want to use the herb and have the most uh, essential oils on the leaves of the plant because that's, that's what you're looking for. That's where the scent comes out. But the other side of it too is having some flowers for the pollinators to enjoy. These pictures are a little small, but that's okay. But you will find bees, butterflies, birds, everyone enjoying all the flowers and not even just the flowers, but enjoying the herb itself. So what I like to do with a lot of my herbs, some of them get mixed in the landscape and whether they get mixed in the landscape uh, in the ground, you just have to make sure that it's the same watering needs. Sometimes they're not in the ground at my house. You see uh, containers throughout the front and the back in one section because I, I put them near things that might be good and just add some variety, depth, color, and more bees and butterflies to that area. So along with landscape for your herbs, you have container gardens too, which we're gonna have a little, we're gonna do a little section on container gardens. Um, habitat gardens, like Cindy was talking about at the San Carlos Library. So you'll notice that it was said earlier, I love mixing all mine and they get mixed and they get mixed in vegetable gardens too. So, so a lot of times every year, my tomato area gets basil. So I get basil in there because I think they go well. I don't, I don't know they do, but um, I just they like- They together. <laughs> yeah, they live together. I put my container, I've had a big container of spearmint and I put that between my mandarin that's in a container and another little calamundin bush that's, that's next to it. It's just, it, and the lovage is there too. So they're all mixing together and they all get, they share the pollinators. And that's the cool thing about it is they, they share and you see them sharing. And when you're outside enjoying some quiet time in your garden, you see it happening and it just brings you to life. Well, it brings me to life. So that's what happens. Uh, my kids and my family get pictures of the butterflies everywhere and the caterpillars that are everywhere and the pretty colors that they are. And they're like, okay, mom's outside again. But it all, it, it all works for a great balance of garden space. And so that's what we're all about here is a great balance of, of uh, garden space. And so I just wanna show you a couple of things uh, during the pollinator section. If you could just go over to me, if you can do that, Laura. And this is a mint. It is a, a pineapple mint or an apple mint that has been going for years and years. And I just keep dividing it up, which we're gonna learn in a couple of slides how to divide your plants up and starting a new piece and starting a new container. But this I have on the table in the back because you know we're spending a lot of time in the gardens, right? Outside. And it's in the center of the table where we've been eating uh, dinners when our kids come over. So that's the pineapple mint. This is an oregano, which you're gonna see in a few minutes too. But this was started last year, small container. And this is the herb that I love, an annual anise hyssop. Now this is baby, I transplanted it. I have a bunch, I have a couple for Cindy and a couple for another friend. And this will grow, grow, I pinch it back. This is great in salads, but it gets a big purple spike and that's the flower. The flower, you can take it off and spread it across the top of a salad and it is tastes amazing. It has a little bit licorice flavor. If you don't like licorice, you won't like it, but it's one of my faves. But just a few things that happen in the pollinator garden, the bees love that anisissa because the flowers will start going and it will be crazy, so. And I might say, Kathy, that um, everybody's focused on the honeybee being attracted to our herbs and um, other things in the garden. But what you, what you can't see are native bees. They also love um, the herbs. Mm -hmm, they um, do. They, they're very small and you, they fly really fast and you hardly see them at all. Mm -hmm. So you're really serving a lot of the community and helping a lot of pollinators. Yes. And hoverflies too. Mm -hmm. 
That was on the picture earlier. Okay, yeah, we'll go back to the considered one of the native bees. Yeah, back to our, our screen because next on our slide, we're gonna talk about propagating. Now we want, we, we like to go into propagating here. The, these are some little, uh, little lavenders on the side of the picture there that I use in my garden. That's my culinary lavender. I like, I pick that off and it gets, it gets saved in jars and dried and saved, but we're going to go through some propagating methods. Um, and this is the one inexpensive and easy way to get new plants from the plants you have to share with your friends, to, to bring over to Cindy's house when you go there for lunch or anything like that. So we'll have Cindy start with stem cuttings and she's going to show us how to do a stem cutting and some details associated with that. So I'll see you in a couple slides, guys. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna talk about stem cuttings. Um, I like doing stem cuttings myself. Um, I get, I feel very rewarded when I can take a stem and cut it up three ways and get three plants out of it. Um, so anyway, the first thing we need to do is we need to start with um, a container full of white perlite. Perlite is um, um, volcanic material. Here, I'll show again. And it's damp. And you could probably just keep the big screen on for a while. And um, then the next thing I do is I go for my stem. I look for a stem that's on new growth and is real healthy and has really nice nodes if I can find them. Um, this is not an herb, but it, the, the nodes are pretty large and I thought it would be easier to see. It's a cinerera actually. So you see these stems here. Those are, that's where there's nodes. And you can see right in here, that's growth from a nerve, uh, um, the stem. In this stem, the meristemic cells have gathered at these nodes. They, they're throughout the the plant, but heavier where the nodes are. That means that's the growing material for plants. So of course, that's what we want to access. We want to access that growing material and hope we can grow some roots. Um, so that's what we're going to do. I've cut the branch off and there was some green here, which I removed. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put some root hormone. We hold up the jar for you. This is the jar and I'm going to take it. I put it in the lid of my container and I'm going to place it on the, horn, the, the node and the bottom of the plant. The root hormone is more meristemic cells to increase the probability of, of growth. Okay, so I have it on there. I have it on pretty well. I'm gonna take my chopstick. If you don't use chopsticks in the garden, you're missing out. They're good for all kinds of things. And I'm gonna make a hole in my perlite because I do not want to knock off the meristemic material. And I'm going to drop it down into the, into the hole. I'm going to bury the first node and I'm going to leave the second node um, up. The, the bottom node will grow roots, we hope, and the top node will grow leaves. Um, we don't want to start out with a lot of leaves on our um, stem because the stem has no way of um, handling um, um, the, the, sun, the sun coming in and hitting it and then it and it, there's no roots to process that energy. So we want to, after we do this, we want to keep it in a shady place, maybe a little light and let, let it just sit. If you're going to propagate this way, you need to be patient. Is this going to take, well, it's going to take a while, three months before you really feel like you've achieved something. Um, so, and then we're going to keep this medium wet, not soaking wet, but, um, damp and and then and hopefully in three months we'll have some growth here don't yank it out too early though you'll start having a little growth here doesn't mean that there's a lot of roots yet um, so leave it so that it really 
the roots really develop. Uh, the most important thing on a plant is its root system. You want a good, healthy root system, then you'll have a good, healthy plant um, ongoing. So I'll let you know how this works. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's uh, stem cuttings. So we'll go on to um, um, the divisions. The divisions. And one thing about stem cuttings before I before I continue on, we all probably, well, I know I did when I was younger, used to watch my grandma or my mom too, just cut off the piece of the geranium or scented geranium as we would now, because we love to work with rose scented geraniums and apple geraniums and things like that. And um, cut it back and find their nodes and clean it off and put it in the dirt. And that worked for them, you know, so, but this is a more detailed way to get it. So it does work for sure. And they might have stuck three of those in the ground and maybe one or two worked or maybe all three of them worked. But um, what Cindy showed you is pretty much so we use the rooting hormone and it works pretty well. But then what's the other way to get some plants? Because we get these, we get these little plants and we buy them at the nursery or we bring a friend over a little pot as you see in the picture here. My little container over there, this is oregano as it's, it says there, but it truly is oregano. And what I do, because I, I know it's been in that pot for since last year. So it's time to divide it because I was going to make this into a, a big girl plant, you know, a big plant. So uh, I want to make sure that the container has water. So I water it a day or two beforehand. And you want to do that just, it keeps everything intact. You remove the entire plant from the container. As you can see on the right hand side, there's a root ball in there and everything. And I'm gonna show you this cause we're gonna, in a couple minutes, but not right now, um, the root ball's there. And right behind that is my trusty little knife that I use and you can use, that's a hori hori knife and I'll show you that in person here in a minute. But you can use anything from the kitchen, anything that works for you, um, put it on a, a, a safe place or a, something that you're not gonna make a mess on. So if we go to the next slide, if we go to slide nine, I think it is you'll see you wanna continue with the cut. And the hand there is above the knife. It's above the cut is because these knives are really sharp and sometimes the root mass gets a little stronger than you think it might, it should be. So uh, in order to continue with that, I took that little plant, that little in the four inch pot and I made four plants out of it. What I do is I trim the roots and I trim the crown and make sure everything's kind of even and place it in soil with a little bit of compost because in my garden, I use compost and keep the soil fed and keep worms going and things to everything that's real healthy in our soil is right there. And that's all I need with these uh, most of my perennial herbs and things in the, in the ground and in my containers, especially too. If it isn't a container, I would use potting soil with a little compost and then you water it again and you get more plants. You, so you get four out of one, and I bring yeah. them to Cindy's house and to your house. Yeah. So if you can come to me, I mean, uh, take the slide down so you can see me, see me. <laughs> anyway, here's my oregano again. And I figured this was gonna be a real tight ball of roots because everything was coming out the bottom and this was attached in the container that I stuck it in before it was winter. Well, it wasn't as root bald as I thought it was. You can see some roots there, you see that. So that's probably where the cut was when I put it together last year, but there's, I would divide this, it's ready. It didn't show the massive amounts of roots that my photo did. So um, I chose not to divide it. I was gonna have it divided and show you both halves, but this is good. It just takes it right out, you take it right out of the pot. It didn't come out freely. It, it wanted to fight me. And so what I had to do, which is no secret because I love my hori hori knife, is I, can, it's kind of glary, huh? It, I use this and this is my garden knife. No one gets to use it but me. <laughs> my husband's tried, but I make him clean it off and then we put it back in its container and it goes where I know it is. So I get to use it again. So this is my hori hori knife, or again, you can use anything from your kitchen. As you see, I'm in my kitchen and you can, you can use that kind of thing. Also, when I'm gardening like that, I know you don't, probably everyone has some kind of a little 
little scoopula, little shovel thing. And then your, and then your felt goes for when you do have to trim off the crown and the roots. I use these. I love these. Um, my my felt goes, but my cutters. So that's about it for dividing. So let's see what's next on the schedule here. Um, so we're going to learn how to sow some seeds from Cindy. Okay, sowing seeds is uh, another thing I really like doing. Um, it's a great way to start herbs, though not all herbs start really well from seed. Mint isn't a very good uh, um, uh, herb to start from seed. And mint is so easy to propagate, as most of you probably know, that the best way to do it would be to, you know, take a piece from your mother or your friend's garden and put it in the ground. It'll grow. Um, you can also sow seeds from your own um, garden from the year before when your flower goes, to, when your plant goes to seed, um, you can save those seeds, which we'll talk about later. Um, I saved some seeds from the herb garden in, um, in San Carlos, some sunflower seeds. And um, I'm hoping to plant them real soon. Uh, I harvested them in the fall and hopefully they'll do me really well, I hope so. So if you're not harvesting your seed and you're, you're, you're buying your seeds from a commercial source, um, the first thing I would do after I buy, this, buy the seed packet and I'm ready to plant, I would turn it over and read the instructions. It tells you um, at what depth to plant. It tells you um, when, what time of the year to plant, how much light the plant will need. It gives you over a huge amount of information to make you successful at growing seeds. Um, you can plant in a container you know, a four inch container, or you can plant in a flat, big flat, um, however you wanna do it. Sometimes people plant directly into the ground. Some seeds like being planted directly into the ground. They don't like being transplanted. Um, so this time of the year, it's still kind of cool at night. So you might wanna use a heat mat under your seeds. Uh, this will keep the seeds warm because some seeds need to be a certain temperature before they'll germinate. That's the tricky part of growing uh, this time of the year. So um, um, okay. So once your seeds grow, um, they'll turn into, they'll grow, as you can see from the picture, there's a long stem with two little doodads there at the bottom. Those are called cotyledons. And those uh, little leaves are the first to come up. I have a picture of, uh, could I have another big screen? Sorry. Um, I have uh, some cotyledons here that I'm growing. That's a cod those are cotyledons. They are not true leaves. This is a flax plant. And um, true leaves will grow out from these cotyledons. The cotyledons, thank you. The cotyledons are um, sent up by the ovary of the, se of the seed um, to nourish the seed so that it can grow roots and eventually true leaves. So those two little leaves really um, have an important job. So when you're planting seeds, a lot of people are so anxious that they pluck the seed out and ready to put it in the ground when those cotyledons come up, but that's the plant won't grow if you do that. You need to let it grow to have some, at least three or four true leaves. And then you know some roots have grown underneath the soil and you're ready to, um, um, to plant the seedling. So um, don't be fooled by those little cotyledons. And then we're going to keep the, soy, the, the seed moist. Um, when my father worked at Ferrymore Seed, I used to watch them. They used to grow in blot, on blotters in germinators. It just fascinated me. Um, and they germinate seeds that way. Um, but of course, um, today, I'm not a scientist, so I grow in soil, <laughs> a nice uh, loomy soil, uh, loose soil, because you want to make sure that there's air pockets around the bottom of the plant so that um, so the roots have air to grow. If it's compacted and there's not air, air 
pockets around the roots or in the soil, your roots will be stifled and suffocate. So you know, that's why we use a nice loomy soil so that there's uh, air pockets around the roots and everybody will be happy and you will have a beautiful plant. All right. Okay, next. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so good. <laughs> So this is showing this is showing some rosemary that Elkus that we grew at Elkus Ranch, which is one of our locations where our office is actually, and we have a garden over there. This was for our spring garden sale, I think, two years ago. So this is the rosemary, and I just wanted to show everybody that um, transplants happen, whether you buy them at buy them at the nursery or you get them from a friend or you buy them from one of our sales. It's the same, it's basically the same rules as dividing as far as watering your, your herb well before you're, going to trans, before you're going to change it off. And that reminds me too, as far as dividing goes, it's best to do that in the spring. I don't think I mentioned that, but that's when the hormones are starting to grow. Things are, things are going great. And the same thing with transplanting. I think things happen best in the spring, maybe, maybe the summer when there's some, another summer month left or whatever, but you want to make sure it's watered well lift it from the container, gently loosen it. If there's a root ball, if you have that round thing going on under there, um, loosen that up. And many herbs are fine with trimming that if need be to put it into your container. Your soil prep is the same. It would be your potting soil if it's going into a container with some, a little bit of compost. And I say a little bit because I burned out some plants before. So I look at the size of the container and I'm sorry, I don't have an exact measure because I don't. And I usually take a small handful and mix it in with, with the soil and all the good things for the soil. And just make sure you're feeding the soil and your plant will thrive. Make sure you water it once and it, it's in its new location and it's even and you're, you're ready to go. Uh, that's where you want it. So, um, then you water it when it's new, when it gets dry. And then after that, usually the next year, it's, it's pretty drought tolerant to what the rest of your garden would be. Containers, you have to water a little more often, like Cindy said uh, in the beginning, in the beginning of the slides. So that's transplanting with this rosemary. And then our next slide shows an area that Cindy and I both love. And which is herbs and containers. And usually we both show up to a presentation with a container full of herbs uh, packed kind of tight or like this one was in my garden and spread out. We were having friends over and I wanted to make some space. So I stacked them and they lived like that the rest of the year. In fact, they still might be out there now, but at the bottom, the bigger pot down there has an oregano. That bigger leaf at the bottom is the oregano. Right behind it is some thyme. The second one is a sage, a garden sage, we call it. And then the top is rosemary again. So those sages go, those, those sages are just beautiful in there. And everything has a different fragrance in there. And it's just wonderful. If you want to get the fragrance of an herb and you're not sure, do I like sage? I don't know. You take the, you touch the leaf, you just rub it slightly and you can smell it. And you can tell by the smell if you're gonna like the flavor of it. There's different sages too. There's a bergamot sage, which I adore and has a much wider leaf and things like that. But that's how you tell with the fresh herb when you're herb shopping, if you're gonna like it or not. You don't have to really put it in your mouth. You just get the fragrance. What do you think, Cindy? Okay. I agree and you know, um, this little herb bouquet that I did smells fantastic mm -hmm. to have this sitting in your kitchen um, with these herbs it has rosemary and oregano um, it just smells so good yes i know that i like all those herbs because they all smell good <laughs> i know yay so let's see what's our what our next slide is it will surprise us one more one more Oh, yes, <laughs> right up my alley. So this is my lovage plant, which I just, I adore lovage too. So this comes up every spring. It's about that size now, right now in my garden, it started coming up a few weeks ago or two weeks ago. And, and it's, it's about the same amount there. 
But you might wonder maintaining an herb garden, what's to maintain an herb garden? Well, because we told you, Cindy told you in the beginning, we don't really fertilize, but we make sure our soil is composted and our soil is healthy and mulched after. So you wanna make sure that you're taking good care of your soil. So your herbs and your other plants and edible flowers will, will survive wonderfully. So to maintain a perennial. Okay, so we went through, let's divide it in the spring. Part of dividing in the spring too, and I didn't have it written, we didn't have it written there, but is if you wanna propagate any stems, that's when you'd wanna do it too in the spring. So divide in the spring when the hormones are all are going and the plant is ready, like this one is ready to go. So I will do this next week or maybe tomorrow. <laughs> How's that sound? Have a plan for flowers, like that second parsley I always have. You know, I know I'm gonna, that's gonna flower. Cause right now as I've been sitting facing my big window in the back to the backyard, I've seen, I've seen some, I think they're in a swallowtail butterflies already, but there are butterflies with yellow in them around. I haven't seen any of their larvae yet or anything like that, but there's, there's, there's things happening back there as we're sitting here talking. <laughs> so have you plan for flowers. Another good plant to have a plan for flowers with is sage because sage likes to flower too after like three years or so and it gets a beautiful purple flower on it and everything's attracted to that. Who, who can't stay away from purple, right? <laughs> None of our beneficials. So if, if part of maintaining your herb garden is to use them, pinch back everything, take that stem with that leverage, see that hand there, it's probably my hand, just take that stem off and I use that in salads and I love it. It's kind of a cross between celery and parsley, but it's a great leaf. It's a great leaf to have in your salad and it's fresh and vibrant and everything like that. If you end up not using them, because many people think, oh, the plant's so beautiful, and then they go in the house, and a week goes by, and then another week goes by, and they come out, and it's lanky, and it's not looking like it used to. It was so nice when I bought it. What did I do wrong? And mostly, we tell them, you didn't use it. So if you use it and pinch it back, you're going to get more lush, more stems coming from that and you won't have to prune. If you end up at the end of summer having to prune, then you prune back just like a landscape plant about a third of it at a time because you don't wanna kill it off. And part of our thing in California here is overwintering these perennials, um, which we can do so easily. So to overwinter them, you wanna cut them back. Um, usually a perennial herb will have some wood at the bottom and you don't want to cut into the wood so deep, but, but I, I leave, maybe that's about two or three inches, it, depending how big the herb is in the first place. And you just make sure it's all even, it's cozy for the winter, you make sure it's well mulched and it will overwinter and you will see growth, like probably it's the end of March right now, the growth starts usually around here the end of February at my house anyway. So. So just have fun with it and see how it works. And any annuals, plant in the spring, maybe plant your basil when you plant your tomatoes, you know, plant, um, bring that mint over. Like Cindy said, it's so easy to propagate mint. Dividing mint is easy too. I mean, so, and I, that's what I do a lot just to keep the plant healthy, keep it going from year to year. If you have a special plant, like I do this one, uh, this one apple mint, it's from a special place many years ago and I just wanna keep it going. So I love if someone asks me for it, they always get a piece. And what I do is I take it out of the container and, and I will cut it like a pie and I give pieces that way. So that's maintaining. So let's see how we can harvest. All right, Cindy will tell us how to harvest these seeds. Well, Kathy, I just wanted to tell you that I do have an Anna Swallowtail that flies through my garden in the summer. Yeah, good. And today, I saw a bunny rabbit in my garden. Oh, oh. my God, I was shocked. It was a little <laughs> brown rabbit. I don't know where it came from. I live in the Aww. city. I don't know where it came from, and I'm hoping it doesn't eat my garden. It I was just going to say. Garden. <laughs> They like to eat things, right? <laughs> yes, they do, especially okay. herbs. Yes. Um, okay, anyway, I thought I'd throw that in. Thank you. Um, harvesting seeds. Um, 
what I usually try to do is I try to eat my uh, herbs spring and summer and then fall um, as the plant is getting ready to go dormant, I'll let it go to seed. Um, I do that for a variety of reasons. I let it first, it will flower, which the insects love. They just go crazy over herb flowers. And then it'll go to seed, which I collect. Um, the way I collect it is um, I let the, the, the plant flower and then it seeds, and then the, the branch will brown and turn dry. That's when you cut it off and you put it in a brown paper bag. My friend Kathy has one that she's got. Oh. If she can, she I held that up, Kathy. And then you just hang that upside mm -hmm. down and the seeds will drop out into the bag. Thank you, Kathy. Can you see it? Okay. Uh -huh. And then the seeds will drop out into the bag and um, then you will collect them. I have a package here of seeds I've collected. Um, it's a, it's a, it's actually a flower. Um, and every year I collect, I don't know, thousands of seeds. Don't ask me why I collect so many. And then in the spring, I, um, I, <laughs> then in the spring, I um, throw them out into the garden and I get, uh, it's a flower, it's a white flower, uh, Minonin, and it's, uh, it's lovely. And so I do that every year. Um, there's some herbs that we grow for the seeds, uh, anise, caraway, cilantro, flax, dill, um, those plants we grow strictly for the seed, though we can eat the, the foliage, we also um, save the seeds. Um, nice. We use these seeds in our foods and let's see what else here. Um, I think that's pretty much what I have to say about drying or harvesting seeds. Okay. Um, just do it once the flowers, let it dry and collect the seeds, put it in the bag. And once you've collected the seeds, you want to put it airtight bag because mm -hmm. uh, you want them to stay fresh. Mark the yeah. seed bag or the container with what it is and the date that you harvested it and so that you'll know uh, you don't want anything over a year old. So that little picture is the second parsley at my house that's allowed, that was allowed to flower that year. So they usually go back and forth. They have one on one and the other end. So that's how it works. I just go back and forth with it. Yep. So let's see how to harvest them then to use them. So these, okay, so I'm gonna talk about the plants out there, of course. So the one, the bigger bush on your left-hand side, it says lemon verbena, and that's lemon ver verbena is a tender perennial. It makes the best like herbal beverage, or I'm gonna say sun tea or whatever you, that's how I make it. I take the leaves off, rinse them, and then I put it in a glass jar and it sits in the sun and it's, it's just wonderful. So when you come over to my house, that's, anybody, they always get offered a lemon verbena tea. And I just, I just love it. So I have two of those plants, one in the back against the fence and one in the front. And they're just starting now. There's, there's not even that much growth on it yet. That's, and, and I use that. So I, I use everything I get with that. So when I go out to harvest, you want to do it in the morning, you know, after the dew and things like that. So basically it just, it says it right up there. So it's, that's a no brainer, right? But the next picture over is um, some flowering chives and that is a regular chives. This is a container that was in Cindy's backyard when I went over her house and we were rehearsing something that we were going to be giving in a couple weeks. And, and so we have the chives there with flowers and she was growing that for the flowers. Right below it is uh, some, um, nasturtium leaf. You can't really see it that clear. It's very small, but that's going to grow up. That was going to grow out. So that was in another salad, I'm sure a month from there. And there were some pansies in there too. But she made the salad for lunch and it was the first time I ever ate a chai flower and I loved it. I loved it. So of course I had to take some home, get my own chive seeds and start my own. And I have them now in my backyard going <laughs> and I keep doing that. I use the chive plant the same way, keep doing it all the time. So once you go out and pick everything in the late morning, um, 
let's see, you can go, I was gonna show you my little scissors that I use. I don't need a large screen for this, I don't think, unless you, because they're just basic little scissors. I don't wanna rip anything off a stem. I usually cut it, or if you want, you could use your larger, your larger cutting shears. But um, I just wanted to show you a little, a little scissor here. But if we go to the next slide, you see you bring everything in. So you're going to cut everything, put it in a basket or whatever you're going to use, a paper, whatever you're going to use, a, a kitchen towel or something, and bring it in the house. And you want to rinse it. And I like to let it air dry. That's with any herb that we bring in the house. Um, we don't want to force heat on it or sunshine on it. That's, these are very delicate right now where they're off their, where they're off their mother plant. So I want to tell you a little bit about each stem, at least the first two. That one on the end there, that's parsley. That happens to be my, my uh, a parsley that was going to flower and I didn't want it to flower. I was fighting it and fighting it and just um, saying, you're not going to do this. I want you because I only had one plant that year. And that's just when I was kind of figuring out what, what worked and what didn't work. Well, it doesn't really work to keep cutting it back like that. You notice the stem, how thick it is. It almost looks like a mini tree. I mean, it was way too much. The flavor on the parsley was not that good. <clears throat> and I just wanted to show you what not to do. The middle one is a lemon thyme, which I also love lemon thyme on fish and veggies. And I dry it and I, I, I love that herb too, but that's very woody. That is not a healthy specimen. That's not a healthy piece. I guess I went on vacation too much that year and didn't pay attention to what was happening in the little wine barrel that had housed all the lemon thyme and it went crazy like that. And so I cut it back a lot, brought it upstairs to show you that's way too woody. That's way too woody for good flavor and see how lanky it is around the top. That's really what you don't want. <laughs> the, the next to it is a cutting celery, which is really an herb, a cutting celery. It doesn't really, I don't think you get celery stalks out of it, but Cindy has some cutting celery down at the San Carlos library or garden. And so it's really a thing. And she's the one that told me about this and I really like it. She gave me some dried cutting celery and I used that on fish, I think too. And it was really good. So since then, it's one of my favorite things too. So basically make sure you rinse and air dry and we'll go to the next slide. And I just want to say something before Cindy talks. It, you know, it, we used to, I used to always think that, oh, herbs and flowers and everything dried best upside down like that picture you see. You just gather them, bunch them up and hang them up on the side of the kitchen, right? Because that's what they said to do. That's totally wrong. Because first of all, that big bunch there is um, all moist together. The only thing that's drying is on the ends, really. And plus, there's too much light in that room where that is. It's If it is near the kitchen, it's getting cooking orders and heat and people walking by it. It's not really a healthy place for herbs to dry. So let's see what Cindy has to tell us about that. <laughs> um, herb drying is one of my very favorite things to do with my herbs. I've dried... Um, um, Bay. Um, if I see someone that has a bay tree, I ask me if I can, you know, can I take a cutting of your tree or a little branch and I go home and dry the leaves and use them all year in my cooking. Um, so I started drawing things and I thought, well, you know, what's the best way to do this? And I discovered that the best way for me was to use, um, can I have a full screen? was to have a, um, a basket um, with a, lots of air holes. Don't wanna shove my face out of the way here, but I think you can see what I have. And um, the reason for that is there's a lot of air circulation, which will dry the air, the herbs quickly, which is what I want. I want my herbs to dry quickly um, so that I can put them in an airtight container and um, they won't lose very much flavor. So what I do is I go out in the morning, pick my herbs, then I wash them and I dry them on a paper towel. And then I put them in my, um, I take them off the stem because I believe that there's moisture in the stems, which prevents the herb from drying quicker. And so then I um, put my herbs in the basket and it looks like that. And then in um, a few days, the herbs dry. 
And then my very favorite part of the whole thing is I can just take my hand and run it across the bottom of the screen and I will have the perfect size herb, which I will show you for cooking. I hope you can see that. Yeah. So then I put it in, I can either put it in a jar. This one happens to be an oregano jar, but I marked it um, oregano and the date and I'll put it in here and store it and use it um, as the season goes on. Um, I really like this method. You could use um, the oven, you can use a dehydrator. Um, there's other ways to do it that work very well, uh -huh. but I like the, um, the wire basket. It works so, really, really well for me. Can I say something I wanna tell you because I couldn't find a little basket like what Cindy has and maybe I hadn't looked that well, but I wanted to find a way that I could do it too that worked. So I get a cookie sheet and I put like a rack on top of that, like a rack you'd like cook something on or maybe cool cookies on, I'm not quite sure. Put that yeah. over the cookie sheet or, or jelly roll pan, whatever you wanna call it. And I lay the herbs across on that. Now I don't take them off the stem because my rack squares are bigger than that little screen that Cindy has. And I can dry them that way. I just have to make sure that I take them off the stem as soon as they dry. They, you don't want them sitting around on that, like Cindy said, because then they're not vibrant the, anymore. The important thing is that there's air circulation. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how you achieve that. I got this at the thrift center. <laughs> and yeah. um, um, as long as there's air circulating around your drying herbs, however you do that, um, it works. Okay. So let's so, show some of our little goodies. These are some dried herbs. Yes. That I put in little containers and Cindy has them too. And I, I have, uh, I have some dried uh, lavender that I dried off lavender plants that I keep in my jar and I make um, lavender shortbread cookies out of them. Oh yeah. And the, oh, if you open the jar, it smells so, so good. Lavender cream cake, Cindy. Here, plus yeah. here's some little, things, sachets made with lavender. And these go, if someone invites me to a shower or a wedding shower, everybody gets one of these as favors. They make great hostess gifts. Yeah, they make, they're great. So they're I think you can save old herb bottles. Um, and you know, after the herbs you purchased are gone and put the herbs in there, or you can use little containers. Uh, it doesn't really matter as long as it's airtight. There's all different kinds of things to use. <laughs> And they make uh, your dried herbs make great gifts. If you oh, want to do. dry, if you dry some oh, oregano and some thyme and some basil, and you mix it together and you make a nice Italian seasoning, um, makes a great little gift. Or you can do an herbs de Provence uh -huh. with a so, little lavender lavender added. Wait, so um, when you're cooking with herbs too, Cindy, and uh, you have the dried herbs like this that someone gave you or that you're using yourself. You, you could put a dried herb in a sauce or something right as you're putting it together and it cooks and the fragrant, or the aroma gets into the sauce and everything's really good. If you wanna use your fresh herb, like maybe some thyme or tarragon or something, it's really neat to be able to get that and get your fresh, get your pasta right out and you put your fresh herb on top of that and then the oils release and it's really yummy. It's really mm -hmm. special. And I might also say that oregano is one herb that right. tastes better dried than fresh. Yeah. Um, I would always use uh, dried oregano opposed to fresh oregano. Right. It can... So when you use dried herbs, you want to make sure that you don't, if it says, uh, let's say it says one tablespoon, uh, one, tea, one, table, one teaspoon of rosemary, fresh rosemary, and you don't have fresh rosemary, but you have dried rosemary, you want to use half the amount that's in the recipe because it's so strong uh, mm -hmm. dried that uh, right. it will power your dish. It's stronger. And so when you put it in your, when you measure it, put it in your hand and it's dried, you can crush it right there in the palm of your hand and then let it go into your, into your dish because um, that releases some more of the oils and fragrance right there, cooking with it. Okay. So should we, we have time to show them how to make uh, vinegars maybe for this? I don't have a slide for it. 
But I, I enjoy, Cindy's gonna show uh, something she likes to make and what I like to make are vinegars. And I'll show you a jar right here. I have different, different flavors. And what you do is you put two cups of fresh herbs like in a mason jar or a large pickle jar and put your vinegar of choice in there and let it sit for a month in the dark, in the cool dark pantry. And I mix different ones. So this is tarragon. So it's tarragon, last year's tarragon. And I, I, this is decorative, the sprig that's in there. It's not what I use to flavor it. And I used a white, probably a white wine vinegar here. I have a pineapple, mint, apple cider vinegar, which is really good. So different flavors that way. And these are good gifts too, as long as it's vinegar in your dried herbs. So let's see the bouquet garni, Cindy. Do you have it today? Yes, I do. Um, I saw this somewhere. I can't remember where, if it was in a book or what. But I, um, a bouquet garni, um, I never have cheesecloth at my house. So if I have to make a bouquet garni, I'm in big trouble. But then <laughs> I learned you can make it in a leek. So you take the outer leaf of a leek off, wash it, and then you put in, uh, you pack it with um, bay leaf, garlic, herbs, whatever, and then fold it up and tie it and then drop it into your soup or stew. It works quite well, and uh, I don't have to worry about cheesecloth. Um, there's so many things you can do with herbs. It's there. just, it's another whole lecture. Let's this is the tip of the iceberg, and we have a lot <laughs> more ideas, a lot more things going on with what to do with them, because that's the fun of it, too. It's part of the balance that the garden brings indoors. So we all have that together so much. So I think we're probably about ready to take some questions or yeah, let's have some questions. chatting or something like that. Do we have some questions? Yeah. Ooh, yeah. looks like it. Hi. Hi, this is Kathy at The Sin, and we do have several questions for you. Okay. Wonderful presentation, by the way. Thank you so much. Oh, thank um, you. A participant from San Francisco asks, are there any herbs that should not be planted together? And which herbs keep their flavor after drying? Okay, so I have part of this I could answer. I, I know you really don't want to mix different mints together in the same container. They, they start sharing their flavors and scents and then all of a sudden you don't have a true apple mint or a true spearmint or chocolate mint or whatever it might be. So if you're putting those in containers or you wanna keep those separate or like Cindy did at the garden in San Carlos is put them beside each other. So there are separate plants. And the other question was what, what dries well? Was that it? Do you well, want to I think um, most herbs dry well. Mm -hmm. um, I think some don't taste as well as when they're fresh. For instance, basil. It dries very well. You rip the leaves up um, and let it dry. But I don't think it's as tasty as fresh basil. Right. You know, in the middle of winter, you got to do what you got to do. If you, need, if you need basil, then dried basil has to work. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Mediterranean herbs dry very well. Um, sage, um, um, oregano, thyme, very, they dry very well. And, you know, you can also dry your edible flowers like calendula petals. Did you know calendula petals are uh, the poor man's saffron? Um, they're bright yellow and they have a nice peppery taste and people substitute it for saffron. Just a little Good. note, yeah. side note. And um, so dry your edible flowers too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Here's a question. So when drying herbs, is it okay if the leaves turn brown or do they need to stay green to make it okay? I'm not sure I understand that question. If, when they're drying, the leaves will, will turn different color. Is that what you mean? It, but is that okay? The, or do we need to discard some colors. of them? Yes, it's okay. okay. It, it's okay, but you know, for a visual, if you're a picky pants, like I might be, um, Sometimes I try to take some of those discolored things out if I'm putting it in a clear jar. They probably taste the same, but sometimes I think I'm a little too picky for my own good. And um, I start separating things. It gets to be quite a project. But well, taste the brown. Yeah, taste the brown color. And dried see, oregano herbs. Yeah, see if you like the flavor or not. That's what I would do. I, it's all about what you like. 
Yeah, they definitely turn a different color, a dry color, but they're still edible. Oh. Okay, here's another question about herbs. Um, what ambient temperature, minimum and maximum, do herbs prefer? I think they mean if they're growing them inside or can they be outside all winter? Okay. Right. They can be outside all winter. In fact, we prefer that, especially yes. for perennial herbs. You want to keep outside and you want to overwinter them, just like what we talked about earlier. Uh, and put more on them, cut them back. And we don't really recommend growing herbs inside because the essential oils just do not, it doesn't proliferate like it does when it's outside. It's not the same. I mean, you can try it if you have a nice bay window in your kitchen or something. I don't, so all mine go outside. As it far makes as me really mad when I see this um, <laughs> on, and it, I see it all the time. People uh -oh. are growing herbs inside. You can grow an herb inside for about two weeks on your kitchen counter for the party and then take it outside because the herb is reliant on the, the, the sun's rays to form the volatile oil, the taste of the herb. Plus your, your herbs will be leggy, they won't be tasteful. So don't grow them inside. <laughs> grow them next to the kitchen. Oh, and we didn't really give a temperature, so I think, you know, it's just, like, we yeah. talked about putting it in the sun. Depends and, on the herbs. Yeah. Um, but the ones we grow here, they like a Mediterranean climate. They like our temperature here. Um, and it's hotter at Cindy's house than it is at my house, but I, we seem to get the same herbs growing. They don't usually freeze. Um, yeah. But of course, it doesn't get to 20 degrees here. So 20, you know, 10 or 20. So I don't know, but they do fine here. And that's why we can overwinter them so well because we have temperate climate. Yes. Okay. I hope that answers that. <laughs> I do too. So you, were, you were talking about uh, herbs when they flower, they lose their flavor. Is that still true about rosemary? Yes. Oh. Um, the reason mm. the herbs lose taste is because the energy of the plant goes to the growing, to the flowering part of the plant. Mm -hmm. And you don't want that. You want it to stay in the leave of the plant. So if it doesn't flower, I mean, you know, come on. You cut uh, it. Flowering rosemary still tastes pretty darn good. Because it's so strong to begin with. It, yeah, I think it holds it, it well. Right. But um, some of the other herbs definitely take on, take on a different taste when they flower. Sage does. And so does parsley. Yeah. But, you know, like rosemary, I don't think it's a big deal. But you know what? That rosemary that's flowering will attract so many bees. Like the house across the street has rosemary all out front and it's for aesthetic value only. They don't use it to eat, to cook with. And it's purple now. And there are bees all around. It's just wonderful. Yeah, they love that. <laughs> they do. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another question about what is the difference between using potting soil and planting mix? when you're, after you're doing your division or even when you're starting seeds, what do you recommend using for the soil base? I would recommend anything that's got some air pockets, so there's air circulation. And um, you might want to top dress it with some compost so that um, um, the microbes in the soil will come up and bring it down into the soil. Um, I mix mine. I never top dress it, but then I always top dress it with mulch, which I guess would it helps it too, because that breaks down too. Yes, it depends what kind of mulch you use, but uh -huh. um, if you top dress your, if you, so when you're planting, you don't want to disturb the soil, because if you disturb the soil, um, you're disturbing all the wonderful little microbes and wonderful little things that are in the soil that make our plants so healthy. So if you lay this, the compost on the soil, the microbes will come up and drag it down. Um, but you know, certainly when you're just starting to plant something, if you mix some compost in with potting soil, that would certainly yeah. work too. Into a container. That's yes. she's uh -huh. talking about if it's into a container. Okay. How do you keep your hoary hoary knives sharp? Oh, <laughs> very it's good sharp. question. <laughs> It's not used for anything but what I use it for, or, you know, for dividing plants. It's not used to cut open a box or anything like that. My whole family knows. 
when the kid, when my children used to live here, you know, not to touch it, but this, I have never sharpened it myself. And this, I still wouldn't want to get my finger under it. And then I've owned it probably five years now. But what I would do, because I'm a chicken to sharpen it, would take it to the guy that sharpens knives. <laughs> but I, I don't know, because I, I haven't done it yet. You know, the hori hori knife is uh, Japanese. And hori hori means dig in Japanese. And the, uh, the steel that is used in a real hori hori knife is, is it's a uh, wonderful steel and it should remain it should keep its sharp edge if that's you get right. something that's not really a hori hori i see them all the time <coughs> they they are that's not the same steel and they you won't get the same um life out of it this is very heavy it's very mm -hmm. heavy so it's probably why it's still sharp everything on the outside label is in japanese yeah <laughs> It and, is Japanese, and then you that's what you want to buy. You want to yeah. buy a Japanese hori hori knife. And they're pricey, but you know, it's worth it. It's my favorite tool. And don't let your husband use it on any project. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both for all of this wonderful information and all of these great questions. We still have more, but time is of the essence here. We need to uh, wrap it up. So I'm going yeah. to hand this back to Cynthia. And thank you, ladies. Wonderful presentation. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. We had a blast. <laughs> We'd like to thank everyone for attending our fourth Spring Edibles presentation. Kathy and Cindy, thank you so much for the excellent information and amazing tips you shared today. The fifth presentation in the series is Good Bug, Bad Bug with Master Gardener Sharon Winnicky and Il Ileana Bushwalter. You can find the registration information on the UC Master Gardeners of San Mateo and San Francisco website. If you had a question that was not answered, you can email your question to the helpline uh, on your screen, or you can um, also Google it, of course. Uh, and uh, an MG uh, will respond. Uh, we really appreciate pictures on that helpline, uh, along with your question, if you email your questions. Um, helpline information, a copy of the presentation, and the video link for the presentation can be found on our UCMG website as well. Thank everyone for attending and have a very good weekend. Bye everyone. Thank you.